We are parents, teachers, and educators. And like you, we're passionate about restoring our culture for Christ. This is Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Hello again, this is Marlon Detweiler. I'm here with Mitch Stokes, and you have uh, joined us for Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Mitch, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, good to be here. Yeah, it's nice to have you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your family as we get into the topic at hand today. Yeah, so um, I started my career initially as an engineer. Um, so I worked as an engineer for a number of years. Uh, that's my That was my initial background. And then left engineering, went back to uh, school and studied religion and then um, philosophy. I got my PhD in philosophy. Where did you do uh, that? So it uh, did some did some studies at uh, a seminary in Orlando, Reformed Theological Seminary. Uh, then went to Yale and uh, got an MA in religion there. It was mostly philosophy, religion, and um, and then went to Notre Dame and got uh, the the PhD in philosophy there. Okay, very good. That's uh, that's quite a set of credentials and uh, has some nice breadth to it uh, uh, that uh, gives you a lot of context, I'm sure. And tell us a little bit about your family and uh, where you are now, career-wise. Yes, so um, now we're in Moscow, um, Idaho. I've been teaching at New St. Andrews College, a small liberal arts classical ed college um, for, gosh, 18 years now amazing so um so part maybe part of the th the theme here is i'm old you know that's the we, we have we have grown kids uh uh four four of them um the oldest is married uh with a baby on the way and the young youngest two are actually in college uh at new st andrews how many do you have total four four okay very good and and you and we have a and we have a wedding next week. Okay, uh, so one, only one's married so far. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Uh, tell us what you teach there now. New St. Andrews is known to many of our uh, many people in the audience, and would be known as a liberal arts school. But you don't teach in the liberal arts area. Well, that's the, the that's almost like that's a trick question there. Um, the, <laughs> the, kind of the point. So some of the things that I'm trying to. Um, do and we're trying to do it in SA, and I think you guys are part of this as well. Is to integrate the sciences and the humanities and the what we normally call the, the liberal arts, and not do it in an ad hoc or hokey way. You know, to you know, for for a math class, you don't just you know, in order to you do word problems, but that you call people. You know, you say, well, uh, Augustine did was you, you know you try to you you don't do it in a hokey way you do it in a natural way and um a big part of what we do and what i do particularly at nsa is teach uh the history and philosophy of science and mathematics and it's and it's really what when i teach theology and apologetics as well and oftentimes what's interesting is it's really difficult to categorize the course, you know, when you're looking for the, you know, is it philosophy 101 or, you know, whatever it is, you're looking for the, the prefix for the course title. It's really difficult to figure out, okay, is this a math class? Is this a philosophy class? Well, I'm also doing theology. You know, we talk about hermeneutics and yeah. interpretation. So it, it's really, um, and I, and I think that's, that's a good problem to have. That should be something something that we're not necessarily trying to fix. And um, so, so, yeah, I mean, we I, I'll teach everything from uh, philosophy, history of philosophy, epistemology, with study of knowledge, uh, apologetics, hermeneutics, interpretations of scripture how do we know the rule what are the rules of theology and what are you know how do you know what's the right interpretation and we, we can do all this we can do all this sometimes in a single course <laughs> we uh, at veritas we have a curriculum that we call the omnibus 
Yes. For credits purposes, it covers history, theology, and literature. But when somebody asks me to describe it, I say it is intended to be a course where students read the great books in order to think biblically about anything and everything. Yeah, no, that's great. That's, that's a little absolutely. bit like that's what you're talking about. Yeah, and in fact, I've done a couple of the articles in those right in those books. So I, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Well, focusing on the um, sometimes watertight uh, distinctions that we make between STEM and the liberal arts, let's let's at least start with some common ground here for the listener. Yeah. How does the how does STEM science technology? What do we got here? Uh, Engineering and math. Yeah, thank you. Uh, draw a blank there uh, on the spot. Um, but how does that become significant in the context of a real liberal liberal arts education? Yeah, no, it's it's funny. It's it's actually um, the, the integration of this of STEM and the humanities, or what we normally take as the, the typical liberal liberal arts, um, is actually baked into the idea of the liberal arts and the classical education. Um, and, and this goes all the way back to the inauguration of our classical Western liberal arts tradition uh, that started with, you know, essentially started with Plato in his Republic. He introduces you know, the, the proper education, he thinks is the proper education for the philosopher kings. And um, in addition to the the, the disciplines that we call the you know, trivium now, right. uh, he introduces what we now call the quadrivium, and he says that primarily the the, the quadrivium, which it, which consists of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music, or music and harmony, uh, he says that that's really key to training people to think clearly, to be able to and then be, be able to actually lead the, the city state uh, in his context. Uh, and then later that that was um, also part of training for uh, theology and not just philosophy, but theology in the, in the Christian t- tradition. And so this quadrivium is really just the Pythagorean division of mathematics. But the way he, now the way he, he thought of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music isn't exactly the way we do. Sometimes we can try, you know, we think, okay, well, because we're so used to just thinking of it a certain way, we think, well, that's what he meant. And he meant something deeper. He thought, I mean, the whole idea and, and what was central to his uh, philosophy, and, and again, think, remember, this is Plato. This is, you know, I mean, one one um, famous philosopher, some science and mathematician, sums them up this way: uh, You know, all of European philosophy can pretty much be char- characterized as a footnote to Plato. And there is something to that. There's something. It's amazing how much, how many of the questions and many of the, the answers that he provided set the agenda for the West. So, Plato is important. That's my my point there, and that. He introduces, he is what he who introduces the traditional liberal arts education to the West. And in doing that, he actually, the whole assumption for him is that the world, the universe, the physical cosmos is mathematical fundamentally. And so is the human soul. And he thinks that. In, Studying that, studying mathematics, studying how it applies to the universe can actually help guide your soul and purify it. Now, so for him, it's kind of this, what theologians would call sanctification, you know, for, you know, this kind of that, secular. That becomes spiritual sanctification. Yeah, yeah, which is really, really interesting that he thought, and, and, and again, that's not necessarily that we have to think that exact thing, but there's something deep there, namely that. There, the universe, and he even thought this that the this the reason that the universe is mathematical and it applies to both the human you know there's a place for humans at, as a as a integral part of that 
is because he th- he believed that there was a God who created it that way. So God designed it to be orderly and rational and mathematical, but not not just rational and mathematical in the way we think about it. He also thinks, and this is very, very important, that it's beautiful. So beauty was a, just an enormously important criteria for him when it came to what the world is like. Even the, even the, the notion of cosmos, that's, you know, we get the, that, that's a, that, that might even have been coined by the Pythagoreans before him from, that he learned from. Part of what that means is not just a rational, orderly universe, but also a beautiful universe. Because, I mean, that's where we get cos- cosmetic, the word cosmetic. Yeah. From. That makes you sense. Know, so you have this. And so so remember when you, you know, we, we want to tell our kids this. Remember when you're signing up for classes and don't mistake cosmetology and cosmology. You'll get different. <laughs> a different correction. but they they do have a root in this notion of beauty and in in this this you can see in his the, the fact that he includes music or harmony as part of that tradition you know part of the quadrivium he wouldn't even have thought that rational mathematical and beauty would come apart that wouldn't. Have, that just wasn't the on the table. Where did so that you, happen? When? Where or when did that happen? Do you know? It, when? When did he? When did? When did? When did the in the development of thought and uh, educational theory and practice? When did it happen that those two became separate? Yeah. No. That's that's a. It, it, uh, trying to give a non-simplistic answer, you know, the causes are, are, you know, there's a lot of different causes and different episodes in history where that separated in spurts. Um, it, certainly one of the things that uh, where it really happened was, it started to happen is the scientific revolution and this notion of uh so in order to understand the cosmos mathematically, so it's kind of this irony in, in, in fulfilling this sort of Plato platonic vision of understanding the universe mathematically, which is what the scientific revolution, part of what, that's what it was doing. So it was kind of like a platonic dream being fulfilled, yet at the same time, in order to tackle that enormous problem they kind of had to separate out some of the more fundamental mathematics like what aristotle would have called natures or forms things that made and just focus on the math look don't worry about what's causing things to fall let's just characterize the falling objects with mathematics because that's enough for now yeah so there's this separation of duties in order to tackle the problem because the just part of it is so difficult, but then they never kind of come back together. And so, so you have this, that's where the real um, break happens. And then, then after World War II, it happens again in spades. Yeah. But we, we see a real departmentalization of the subjects, the disciplines, and it's, you know, Math classes on one side of the hallway, and si- and and biology is on the other, and they don't touch. Um, yeah. And and we at Veritas, we saw that as problematic and wanted to do something about it with uh, what we what we've done. Uh, yeah, that's great. That's so how great. Does, how does that impact what you teach at New St. Andrews? What does it look like for a history of mathematics or a philosophy of mathematics class and i may get those titles wrong so feel free to correct me but what does it look like you know a third of the way through the year yeah it that's good so we we do start with um ancient greece and uh with some of the things that i was just explaining to set up the the themes that go along through that um i, I will say this too what we end up doing at 
we end with contemporary physics and um, philosophy. And let me just say real quickly, the there's a crisis right now in physics, in contemporary physics, <coughs> where the, the two main theories in physics are quantum mechanics and general relativity, you know, through others, but those two don't fit <coughs> together. They work well in their spheres. Again, there's kind of a siloing there <laughs> and um, a, a segregation, but, but when you try to put them together, they don't, um, they don't, they disagree and they contradict one another in certain ways. And so the next thing is trying to come up with a theory that combine a unified theory of everything. The point here is we don't have a lot of data to go on because it's so expensive to get, and difficult to get. And so the, there's a big scramble and debate over, well, how, what do we do next? You know, where do we direct all of our attention and you know, right now it's, you know, should we go with string theory and, you know, all the, the, but the point is it's a debate over whether or not we should follow beauty and use beauty as a criterion to judge whether a theory is good. So you're basically using beauty and aesthetic judgments in physics to guide you as an indicator of where to go. Can you give an and example people, of that? It's hard for me to grasp that, and maybe for our listeners, can you give us something that we can we can grab a hold of with that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So, um, and this is one of the things that you know. Again, if we had more time, we could we could set this up. But Einstein and some of the the uh, wrote the visionaries of the in the early early twentieth century were explicit about how beauty guided their thinking. So they want a theory that is beautiful. It's simple. It's And they have all these different ways of characterizing beauty. But, some, but when you don't have data, you can't go, okay, well, let's check the data. And if you're coming up with a theory, you don't have, you can't look at the world. How do you know it's the right one? Well, you can't check the world. So what Einstein did before they even, before he could check and do experiments, he had to just figure out, am I on the right track? I think so, because this is really a beautiful theory. And so for years, he used that criteria, criterion for guiding his very thought. And it's a very, you know, beauty we think is very very fair in like that's something that's ethereal and you can't really apply it to something like physics and math it's like well actually actually einstein did it and set this trend that actually goes back to plato and now there's a debate though because they're not sure it's working anyway so so we get to that and we show that theme <laughs> but what does it look like say a third of the way through well it was funny yeah um Yesterday, we were talking about how in the 1600s, there was this, because of the scientific revolution and the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, there's a, this concern about a, who to believe. Like, okay, we've been wrong about the earth moving. That seems pr like a big thing to get wrong. The, <laughs> church, the, the, the church is split. I mean, like, we, we, they're disagreeing over scripture. There's some trust issues here. Right. And so people are worried and they call that skepticism. They're worried about like, okay, what can we believe? Well, there's an anti-skeptical push in the 1600s. Ago. Okay, we can't have people going around doubting and doubting this and that and the other. We're losing our foundations. Well, one of the things they do is they turn, well, the thing they do is they turn to mathematics as a guide to anchor because you think, well, mathematics is certain. I mean, like that, you look at Euclid, that the way of thinking, we can't get into that, but the way of thinking is so fundamental to the West and to the way we think now. You even see this in one of the Protestant confessions, the Westminster Confession of Faith. They take a page out of the mathematician's book in the Westminster, right at the front when they're talking about the Bible. And they say, look, here's how you go about it the way the mathematicians do. And which is really surprising. So we're covering that so in this 
history and philosophy of math and science course and talking about, as we're talking about the counter-reformation and what's going on. And then next week, what we'll do is we'll look at the, um, how Descartes is actually countering skepticism with mathematics. That's his goal. We usually think of Descartes as the ultimate skeptic. He's actually an anti-skeptic. And he says, look, we're going to use mathematics, the, that way of thinking and that way of um, building the system to, to halt the skepticism. Interesting. Interesting. The, um, the idea of your basic biology, chemistry, physics, uh, you know, what we might call the three pillars of science, uh, connecting to a broader liberal arts education. What does that look like as you see this thinking applied? Obviously, there's a basic grammar of chemistry, grammar of biology, grammar of physics kind of thing that fits into our pedagogical model, even for the older student, taking them for the first time in a serious way. But how does that all incorporate as you uh, develop your thinking? And, uh, and what does it mean to uh, uh, the businessman dad or the housewife mom? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. One, um, well, I think you're absolutely right. You say, look, when you when you the solution isn't to get rid of the rigor and the grammar kind of you know let's not do that. It's like, well, the 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 problem is much worse than that. It's that that would be too easy. Yeah, it would be. And it would be wrong. The, the first thing you need to do is to make sure that you do understand the grammar, the. In, without that, you're not going to be able to build the deeper things. You need that. But if you stop there and you just go, okay, let's look at how in biology, let's look at how um, the, the cell works or how the immune system in a human, whatever it is. And you just stop there. Well, I mean, first of all, that's necessary, but don't, if you stop there, you really aren't stepping back and seeing the whole point. Now, the question is, all right, well, how do you step back and see the whole point? You know, you just go, oh, and look what, this is a wonderful, God designed this wonderfully. Now, I, I say, that I don't mean that's exactly what we should be saying, but there's much more to it. And a lot of it has to do with, the fact that these sciences used to be called natural philosophy and natural philosophy actually. So, so all of a sudden we should be thinking, okay, there's something going on. That's a little bit different. You know, we don't call it natural philosophy now you know, and for a reason, but it was because it was philosophy and part of philosophy. And you're studying that part of the cosmos, whether it's organisms or, you know, the chemical aspect or whatever, you know, atoms or whatever it is. But it was in order to understand the universe and to understand the human place in the universe. There's a great picture um, that summarizes this of, of, of wood carving. Um, I would encourage the, the listeners to look for this. It's called the Flammarion engraving. And it shows a, um, it basically I use it to to show students, giving them a visual picture of what philosophy and humans are just trying to do when they're learning. They're trying to, they're looking at the world and all the things that appear to everybody, every culture and every, and they want to know what's going on behind the scenes. But, you know, what is making this work this way? What is our place? They're, they're trying to answer the big questions. And so you, science is actually part of answering those big questions because so for example if you get think about the brain you know i mean obviously that's an amazing um you know a, 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 an, an amazingly designed organism or organ and but there's something more to it there how do you get this physical brain to do some things that don't seem entirely physical, like the fact that we can, we're, we're self-aware and we're self-aware, you know, we can think about our thoughts. I can touch my nose uh, without missing because of how my brain operates, that kind of thing? Yeah, 
that's that's part of it. In, but there's even more. There's this sense of um, you know thoughts. Like you think, okay, well, thoughts. That we're, we're, we know what a thought is. But when you really start trying to figure out how the brain produces thoughts, or even what thoughts are. It's very difficult to see how a brain, a physical, you know, these firing of neurons in this, you know, complex chunk of meat in your head could actually produce something that seems immaterial, like a thought. And so anyways, forget about whether, you know, the, the details of that. The whole point is that there's this big, uh, this goes back to Plato even again, and through Descartes and through the West, where you kind of have this view of a physical body, like your brain and the rest of you, and then a soul or a mind. So you have these two things. And what pe what some people are trying to do today, um, particularly in cognitive science, is say, no, there's not that soul immaterial part. It's just all physical meat. And right there you have in cognitive science this discussion of plato's dualism of body and soul as a going concern okay. so that's just one example and i think for each branch of science you know they come back together and it's it's great to separate them into branches as long as we don't take it too far um each is going to have their different way of connecting to this big picture. But there, but the thing is, is that it should be natural for us to do that. And, the, but the, but the, the real question is how to do that in an efficient way where students are getting the, the facts in the right one, you know, not all facts are created equal. So you need the right. high yield things. Right. So the thing, so whether they're going on to be a doctor or a cognitive scientist or not, the the education that so someone so like Veritas is providing, as you know, it's to prepare either folks for either direction and meaningful for both of them. So it, there's got to be it's not it's not like falling off a log to come up with with an education or curriculum for these kinds of things, and that's the work that you guys have been doing for years and years and years. And you. Um, of all people, you you're dealing with this. You know the struggle and the how to how to get this depth, yeah. Without sacrificing some of the other things that we value, like you, yeah. If you go when you go on to college to be an engineer, you would darn well better know your calculus by the time you get in there. Well, speaking of calculus, we're running out of time here, and I want to give you a chance uh, to plug a little bit. You wrote a calculus text. Uh, it's fairly new. I, when was it published? Uh, last, a couple of years ago. It's a couple of years old. Okay. I didn't think it was that old. Tell us why you wrote a calculus text for a K-12 world. Yeah, it was really as an, so as I went around speaking to different um, schools and educational uh conferences and things like that, I would talk about this integration of math and science and the liberal arts. And, you know, I was doing this in my own teaching, but people would say, okay, th hey, this is great. I'm on board. So what would you recommend I use? <laughs> and I'd have to say, I don't really have anything right now. I know how I would do it myself. So really a lot of it has to do with me wanting to get this out there as an example of the kind of thing that I have in mind. So not just tell people, show them, you know, so it's show, yeah. not tell, yeah. not just tell. And, and so really it was one of those examples. And so I have this plan. Okay. They're the two things that I think are central and really high yield and really designed to integrate STEM and humanities is Euclid's elements and calculus, because the stories of them all go back to the roots of Western philosophy and the liberal arts themselves. 
calculus is really just kind of a manifestation of Plato's philosophy, he would be like, this is what I wanted my academy to do when I charged them to, you know, I wanted them to do calculus. So, so a lot of it was to give people, here's, here's an example. Now it happens to be ironically, calculus is one of the easier ways to do this because it's so central to Plato's project. So I kind of, on the one hand, started with something easy, but then also because it's calculus with something hard. Yeah. And, and so what I did is to make it, again, it's hard to know, is this, is this, a, is this calculus, is this math, is this history, is it philosophy? Well, I wanted to show how you, that could be done, I hope, in a natural way that will allow STEM people to see it, you know, you, it wouldn't be in lieu of a normal calculus class, but at the same time, it gives you the core of calculus, limits, derivatives, integrals, fundamental theory, like stuff that I wish as an engineer, I was like, man, I wish I had known that was what was going on when I was <laughs> doing those high level courses. I wish I had that framework. And yeah. so part of it is to give that framework and that that foundation for later calculus courses. But if someone doesn't go on to a, a calculus course, that's totally fine too. That's not the point isn't to, the point is to get them to see the, the and to get into the yeah. nuts and bolts of how this um, story plays out. That's wonderful. Well, we, we have run out of time. Uh, you have clearly, there's a lot we could talk about. You have really, uh, I hope, whetted the appetite of people, especially to try and understand that STEM is not something that sits alongside and separated from the liberal arts tradition, but rather is is born out of it and connected to it inextricably. Did I say that right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we've got to realize uh, that uh, the kind of education we want to deliver in a classical education is much broader than what we've typically understood in a very narrow way to be a liberal arts education. Thank you for your work and what you're doing, Mitch. We really well, appreciate I, I appreciate you having me on your podcast and thank you for all your work. You've done this. You've been working diligently at this for a long time and it's been a real blessing to a lot of people. Oh, thank you. Uh, it has been a long time, and we, sometimes we feel tired from it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> folks, today we have had Mitch Stokes uh, with us uh, on Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Thank you for joining us.